video, we described electrical forces and their applications. Now we'd like to learn more about where these forces come from. And so we're going to return to the concept of the field, which helps us explain action at a distance forces. So just like with the gravitational force, any charge that we have is going to be surrounded by a field. So we can imagine that this positive charge is going to be surrounded by a field similar to this. And we define this field as epsilon, or E, equals the amount of force in a region of space divided by a charge in that unit of space. So if we have a charge, test charge over here, of 1 coulomb called Q1, the amount of force that this charge experiences is equal to the field at that point, since it's 1 coulomb. And we'll call this Q2. So if we want to know the electric field around a point Q2 at any distance r, we can simply expand this equation. So we know that the force is going to be kq1 q2 divided by r squared, all divided by q1. And so we get that the electrical field around any charge is going to be k. These q1s cancel out. We'll just call q2 q divided by r squared. And this will have units of newtons per coulomb, since we have our force over here, newtons, and our Q1 is in coulombs. So the electric field is defined as the direction a positive charge will go. So that's why in our diagram over here, they're all radiating outwards because any positive charge will repel. If we have a negative charge, then we know that it's going to be attracted, or any other positive charge is going to be attracted towards this negative charge. And so our field lines are all going to be inwards. Now, by convention, we define our strong field with close vector lines and our weak field with farther apart lines. So you can see in our diagram, the farther the distance away from our charge, so this is a large R, the farther the field lines are, so we have a weak field. The closer we are to the charge, the closer these lines are, so we have a strong field. You might be asked to draw the electrical field diagram for a system of charges. Before you do that, there's a couple of things you're going to want to know. So as we just discussed, strong electrical fields are represented by close together lines and weak electrical fields are represented by farther apart lines. These lines are defined, or these vectors rather, are defined for positive charges. And so they start at positive and end at negative charges. Every electrical field needs to start at a positive charge and end at a negative charge, and we'll look at that in our examples. These lines never cross because they are vectors, so you can't have a vector going in two different directions at one point in space. Instead, you'll replace it by the resultant of these vectors. And the final rule is any surface that is approached by these field lines is done so at a perpendicular angle. So if I have a flat surface, then the field lines going out or into the surface have to be perpendicular to the surface. 
So we have our first example. Let's just erase this. We have a positive charge and a negative charge, both of one coulomb. So one coulomb, one coulomb. Then as we said earlier, the field lines are going to have to start at the positive charge and go to the negative charge. As we get farther away from this system, the field has to become weaker. So we're going to space out the lines a bit. Field lines go towards the negative charge and away from the positive charge. And it will be symmetric since both are one coulomb. If we have a similar system, so a positive charge and a, another negative charge, but this time we have a 3 coulomb charge and a 1 coulomb charge, this 3 coulomb charge is stronger and so our system is going to be more shifted towards the right because everything is going to be repelled more so to the right. So we can draw that. Again in the middle we're going to have a straight line going from positive to negative. Then we're going to be shifted a bit more to the right, still symmetrical, and we'll continue the pattern. And our final case is if we're going to have two like charges. So if we have a positive and positive charge, And we'll assume they're both one coulomb. Then they're going to repel each other. And so the field lines, at least these guys are going to be outwards. In the interior, we're going to have something like this. Where this is just the resultant of all the forces. And you can see that in the middle, the there is no electrical field because as you can imagine, if we have a positive charge over here, it's going to have a force coming this way and a force coming this way, and these simply cancel out. And one final scenario that you should be aware of because it's going to be reoccurrent in your problems is the parallel plate situation. So if we have a plate with a bunch of positive charges and another plate with a bunch of negative charges then the field lines from all these charges are going to simply add up and create a uniform field that looks like this and so the electrical field inside this or inside these two plates is uniform and constant and this is very useful for the problems we're going to be doing since the field does not change. So you're going to have constant acceleration, constant force inside this region. On the outside, it's not the case. It looks something like this, but we won't worry about that in this course. All right, so now for an example, before we get to that, let's discuss the Millikan oil drop experiment. So this experiment was performed by Millikan where he had two plates with positive charges on one, negative charges on the other, so that he had a field in between. And what he did is he suspended multiple oil drops in between these plates, such that they were subjected to the force of gravity, and these oil drops were negatively charged so that the electrical field was upwards and balanced the force of gravity such that the drop was suspended in space. And what he did is he determined the mass of the oil drop based on its size. And he then knew the force of gravity that was acting on the oil drop, which was equal to the electrical force experienced by the oil drop, which is equal to the electrical field times the charge of the oil drop. Since he knew the electrical field magnitude, he was able to determine the quantity of charge and what he did is he graphed all the charges 
for multiple trials. And what he found was that they lied on a line. What this meant is that they were all multiples of each other. And he was able to determine the common ratio, which was 1.602 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs, which later became known as the smallest possible charge or the charge of an electron. And so this is the quantity that all other charges have to be a multiple of. All right, so now back to our example, which is a similar situation, but in this case, we're given the amount of excess electrons and we're asked to determine the field's magnitude and its direction. So it's kind of the opposite. So we're told that we have a drop of five excess electrons weighing four times 10 to the negative three picocoulombs that is suspended at rest in an electrical field. We're asked to determine the field's magnitude and direction. So we have our two plates. We have a charge suspended or a oil drop suspended in the middle that is negatively charged. In this case, the Q of the oil drop is an integer number times the charge of an electron. In this case, it's five times the charge of an electron. And so this oil drop is subjected to the force of gravity downwards. And since we know it's suspended in the air, the electrical force has to be upwards. And since it's negatively charged, we know that the electrical field has to be going in the opposite direction of the electrical force. So our electrical field is going downwards. We can then write our equation down where the sum of the forces has to equal zero. We'll define up as our positive direction. So then we have the sum of the forces is equal to Fg plus Fe, which is equal to Fe minus Fg. We know that the electrical field is equal to the force per unit charge, and so the force is equal to the electrical field magnitude times the charge. So we have Eq minus Mg. Q in this case is five times the charge of an electron, but we only care about the absolute value of this charge since we took care of the fact that it's negative in our directions, in our diagram over here. And so we can isolate for our field. It's gonna equal in magnitude mg divided by the amount of electrons times the absolute value of the charge of an electron. If we substitute in our values, we get four times 10 to the negative 15 coulombs because a picocoulomb is times 10 to the negative 12 coulombs times our electrical field, which is 9.81 newtons per kilogram divided by five times 1.602 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. If you plug that into your calculator, you get a final answer of 4.90 times 10 to the four newtons per coulomb. And so the electrical field is approximately 49 kilonewtons per coulomb in the downwards direction. And that's your final answer.